Robinson. So good evening, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the Thorsby Society, both the people in the room, it's nice to see so many people have come out on such a nasty evening to hear the talk live, which I think is much nicer than being on Zoom. But welcome also to the 50 or so people who are already in the Zoom room. Can I just remind people on Zoom to mute themselves, and if they want to ask questions, to type them into the chat, and we'll try and pick up the chat questions and convey them to the speaker at the end of the meeting. So it's my great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Brian Groom. Brian is a journalist, author, and one of Britain's leading experts on regional affairs. Originally from Stratford in southwest Manchester, he started work as a sports editor of the Ghoul Times in Yorkshire, which I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear, but spent much of his career at the Financial Times, where he did jobs including political editor and assistant editor. He also launched Scotland on Sunday, Scotsman Sunday paper in 1988, and later became its editor. He now leaves, lives in Saddleworth. Welcome, Brian. We're looking forward to great interest to your talk. Thank you very much, Alan. And hello, everybody. Uh, we can see all those who come out on a filthy night and um, many of you at home on Zoom. Firstly, for those in the room, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Now, if you can't move further forward or stick your hand up and I'll, I'll talk a bit louder. Um, I'm going to cover um, 180 million years in about 40 minutes. Uh, it's a little bit bonkers, but don't worry, there's no test at the end. Um, based on my book, which came out in April and which I'm delighted to say has turned out a national bestseller. It's um, got to three in the Times top 10 for hardback nonfiction. I think it's sold more than 10,000 copies so far. Um, the book, I, sh I should say, is not all historical narrative. There are lots of um, chapters on social and cultural themes, such as um, Northern women and reformers, writers and artists, how the North-South language divide developed, um, uh, the story of the North's ethnic minorities, um, even the importance of sheep, which is particularly relevant to Yorkshire. Uh, but tonight, I'm going to stick to the main narrative uh, with a few local references. In the past, historians have tended to write off the North before the Industrial Revolution as a barren, uncivilized place. Now, the Industrial Revolution was certainly important. It's viewed by many economic historians as probably the key event in human history. But there is far more to the North story, and as I hope to show, the roots of many of today's issues lie in its past. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of Oops. Ah. Oops. 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 This is working before. <laughs> Shall I try it again? Yeah. No. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Hey. Okay, Doke. Yes, I am. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of pesky questions of definition. <laughs> These two questions I often get asked where is the North? And what is a northerner? Um, and I'm not uh, competent to issue passports, so I can afford to take a liberal, inclusive view. Uh, so to me, the north is where the people who live in a place think they're in the north, um, and not where somebody else thinks they are. Uh, and a northerner is simply somebody who regards himself as a northerner, whether born in the region or not. So it can include the huge diaspora around the world, it can include people born elsewhere who've moved in or lived here for a significant period, whatever. Um, after all, it's not been a single administrative unit since the Kingdom of Northumbria. So it's a cultural question. The Scottish border was largely fixed in 1237. There's sea down two sides. There is a grey area in the south. And insofar as boundaries have been drawn for one purpose or another over the centuries, these have shifted. 
So Cheshire, for example, is today counted as part of the Northwest for government and statistical purposes. Uh, but in Anglo-Saxon times, it was in Mercia, not in Northumbria. We don't know exactly who the first northerner was. Almost certainly a member of a hunting group of an early human species, taking advantage of a warmer interlude during the last ice age to range north in search of food at least half a million years ago. And Britain was at the edge of their range. They will have come across Doggerland, the land bridge that existed between Britain and the continent, now under the North Sea as the Dogger Bank. And there are at least 10 separate waves of occupation of Britain. The climate fluctuated between Mediterranean conditions and long stages of cold, with ice sheets up to three miles thick as far south as the Thames Valley. Much earlier, there were dinosaurs. We don't know who the first human was, but we do oddly have a name for the... Uh, Aha, <laughs> Last week, did that. I'm thinking I can't hear it. I'm yeah, I don't think he's started. Yeah. Well, I think he's frozen anyway. Yeah, great. Um, but we do have a name for the North, indeed, for Britain's earliest identified sauropod dinosaur. Uh, he's nicknamed Alan, and he lived 176 million years ago in what is now Yorkshire, but which at the time was south of the equator. His fossil vertebra was identified in 2015, found on a beach near Whitby after it fell from the cliff face. Alan is in the Yorkshire Museum in York, and he's named after a chap called Alan Gurr, an amateur geologist who found him. The earliest evidence of people appears indirect. Some hand axes were found at Waverley Wood in Warwickshire in 1984, that are made of an andesite rock thought likely to have come from the Lake District about 500,000 years ago. If that's right, then these axes would have been wielded by this chap, Homo Heidelbergensis, Heidelberg man. They were tall and heavily built, and they used stone blades to butcher large animals. There may have been an earlier species, but so far there's no evidence. Mm -hmm. And the earliest settlement in the north that I'm aware of is Star Car near Scarborough, sometimes described as Britain's oldest house dating from about 9,000 BC or BCE. It may have been used as a hunting camp. And the first northerner we can identify is Cartimandua, queen of the Brigantes at the time of the Roman conquest. Her territory centered on Yorkshire, along with much of Lancashire, Northumberland and Durham. Cartimandua ought to be as famous as Boudicca or Cleopatra, yeah, she tends to get relegated to a few disparaging lines in history books. That's probably because she collaborated with the Romans, divorced her husband, yeah. married one of his aides and was overthrown by a revolt. And yet, despite her loyalty, uh, Cartimandua became portrayed by Roman historians as an adulterous betrayer of British men. Yet she succeeded in keeping her territory free from annexation for up to 30 years. So perhaps a more balanced assessment is due. Under the Romans, the North became an important and yet vulnerable frontier region. Some six or possibly seven Roman emperors visited the region while they were holding supreme power. The first to come was Hadrian, who began building his wall in about 122. 
And that's a structure without equal in any of the empire's provinces. In fact, the, the Romans never fully conquered Scotland despite several campaigns, and nobody ever has. Neither the Romans nor a succession of English medieval kings. The wall almost certainly combined a defensive function with customs control and frontier supervision. The third century was a landmark period in which the North gained self-governing status within the empire. And Britain was split into these two provinces. Uh, Britannia inferior stretched from Hadrian's Wall down to south of Lincoln, while Britannia superior, so-called apparently because it was geographically closer to Rome, not because of any value judgment, uh, covered southern England and Wales. This was a turbulent period in the empire. There were lots of soldier emperors and the north was a military zone. So it benefited to an extent from imperial policy that poured money into the military. Constantine the Great was declared emperor by his troops in York in 306 uh, after his father Constantius died there after another Scottish campaign. Constantine had to fight wars against a rival to establish himself. But once he'd done that, he became emperor for 30 years. He's best known for issuing the Edict of Milan, which legitimized Christianity across the empire, which had already been established in Britain. After the Romans departed around 409, 410, there was an obscure period. Elmet was one of a number of small kingdoms to emerge after the Roman period, covering what is now the West Riding, including Leeds. It emerged from pre-Roman British tribes and its people would have spoken Brythonic, similar to modern Welsh or Breton. Uh, it was soon facing powerful neighbors, however. Migrants began arriving from Northern Germany that we call Anglo-Saxon, they become established by the mid fifth century and were in the ascendant from the sixth. The Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Northumbria arguably held greater political power and certainly greater autonomy than the North has ever seen. It existed from the early seventh to the late ninth century and stretched at its fullest from the fourth, Firth of Forth to below the Humber. Four of its kings, Edwin, Oswald, Oswy and Edgefrith, exercised a degree of dominance over other kingdoms north and south. Edwin annexed Elmert, whose last king, Keretich, was expelled in 617. Northumbria vied with Mercia for overlordship of other Anglo-Saxon territories. King Oswald ruled Northumbria for just eight years. Yet he is one of British history's most charismatic monarchs. A warrior known as White Blade or Blessed Arm, Oswald was the first English king to die a Christian martyr and he became venerated as a saint. It's been suggested that he may have been the model for Tolkien's Aragorn in Lord of the Rings, which is plausible if speculative. He was brought up on Iona, he promoted the Irish form of Christianity and invited Bishop Aidan from Iona to establish a community of monks on Lindisfarne. After Oswald died in battle against Mercia, his cult spread across Europe and lasted for centuries. His relics were in huge demand. His head is in Durham Cathedral, but at least four other medieval churches claimed to possess it. <laughs> Northumbria transformed itself in little more than a century from a pagan illiterate society into Northern Europe's leading intellectual, Christian and artistic center. Its golden age uh, produced scholars such as Bede and Alcuin, illuminated manuscripts such as the Lindisfarne Gospels. It sent missionaries to the pagans of Germany and representatives to the court of Charlemagne and it assembled some of Europe's finest libraries. The first mention of Leeds is in Bede's ecclesiastical history, uh, referring to the Regione Quae Vocator Loidis, the region which is called Loidis. 
That may have been an anglicization of a Celtic word, ladenses, meaning people of the fast flowing river. But Northumbria didn't endure. Like other Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, its organization was unstable. It relied on conquest and winning tribute from other kingdoms so the king could reward his followers. Instability increased in the eighth century. Rivalry for the crown grew and kings didn't last long. In 793 came the famous Viking raid on Lindisfarne. And by 867, the great Danish army had seized control of York, thus dividing Northumbria and in effect ending its independent existence. Eventually, Northumbria was to be absorbed into a new kingdom called England. Had Northumbria lasted, uh, then Northern England might today have been the centre of a northern focus, Britain, instead of an outlying region of one governed from the south. The Vikings came first to plunder and then to conquer and to settle. The raids must have been terrifying, but these were peoples of similar ethnic and cultural origin. The Scandinavians became Christianized and integrated with local populations and towns and trade developed, notably at York. We see the legacy today in place names and above all in the English language. Old English had just 40 Scandinavian loan words, whereas today we have about 900 in standard English and many more in local dialects. And they're not just nouns, adjectives and verbs, but also pronouns such as he, she and they. Prepositions such as by and at and even the verb to be, which suggests a pretty close degree of assimilation. In the 10th century, York uh, became intermittently controlled by Viking kings from Dublin, ending with the expulsion of one called Eric in 954. And England became united under Wessex kings, initially temporarily under Athelstan, who was Alfred the Great's grandson, and then permanently under Athelstan's half-brother, Eadred. William the Conqueror was the North's nemesis. His chaplain described him as inspiring even great love and terror everywhere. And Northern England, where the most serious revolts against his rule emerged, certainly felt the terror more than the love. There is some debate about whether his so-called harrying of the North was quite as barbaric as contemporary chroniclers portrayed. But it became a trauma imprinted on Northern memories for centuries. And it still gets mentioned occasionally, particularly in connection with deindustrialization in the 1980s. The harrying came after a couple of serious revolts and a Danish assault on York. William was trying to hunt down rebels and ensure that a future army had no place to hide and no resources to live on. One writer 50 years later said, in his anger, he commanded that all crops and herds, chattels and food of every kind should be brought together and burned to ashes with consuming fire so that the whole region north of the Humber might be stripped of all means of sustenance. As a consequence, so serious a scarcity was felt in England and so terrible a famine fell upon the humble and defenceless people that more than 100,000 Christian folk of both sexes young and old alike perished of hunger. It affected Yorkshire, along with parts of Durham, Cheshire, Shropshire and Staffordshire. The Leeds area may have been spared the worst of it uh, because it was part of lands granted to Hubert de Lassie, one of William's favorites. Now, some historians argue that these accounts are exaggerated. After all, a scorched earth strategy was uh, common in medieval warfare. But I think the combined evidence of the chronicles, a big fall in land values and a large drop in population suggests there was significant devastation. As far away as Evesham Abbey in Worcestershire, one chronicler reported that starving refugees arrived in search of food and died from eating too ravenously. <laughs> 
The main story of the Middle Ages for the North was 600 years of border warfare between England and Scotland. And in fact, the border counties have spent more than half of the past two millennia being intermittently fought over if you include the Roman era. And that's profoundly influenced both nations. Fighting was brutal. Homes and towns were sacked and burned. And amid these wars, the exploits of border reavers included cattle thieving, feuding, murder, arson and pillaging. Reaving, in fact, had ancient origins. You see it in other pastoral societies, and in some ways, it was a functioning economic system for regulating possession of livestock. But the dislocation of the wars, combined with the remoteness of central governments, created the conditions for crime to flourish, particularly in the 15th and 16th centuries. But the border wars weren't everything that was happening in the North. The 12th and 13th centuries saw rapid economic development and population growth, especially east of the Pennines. We saw the start and growth of the woolen industry and the creation of monasteries such as Revo and fountains. In the 14th and 15th centuries, uh, the noble families of the North and those who served them uh, supplied the manpower for wars against both Scotland and France which brought opportunities for profit and political influence. So families such as the Percys of Northumberland and the Nevilles of Durham and Yorkshire became wealthy and powerful. And the spoils of war flowed in the form of ransom money, pay, offices, land, pensions, connections, distinctions and honours. The monarchy, however, became weakened by the cost of the Hundred Years' War against France which was an underlying cause of the Wars of the Roses. Now, these were, of course, not a conflict between Lancashire and Yorkshire, but between rival branches of the Plantagenets, though there were strong, if complicated, north-south dimensions. There were two main phases. In the first, from the 1450s, the North and the Midlands were predominantly Lancastrian although loyalties could be mixed. In the second, in the 1480s, Richard III, the third and last Yorkist king, seized power from a Yorkshire base where he had built up support as his brother, Edward IV's chief lieutenant. Richard's reign was seen in the south as a northern tyranny. Uh, he gave land and offices to northern supporters. But then he was defeated and killed at Bosworth Field because two key northerners, Thomas, Lord Stanley of Lancashire, and his brother, William, deserted him. Some of the main battles happened in the north at uh, Toten near Tadcaster here in 1461. Edward IV won a crushing victory. It was one of the bloodiest battles fought on English soil. On entering York, Edward ordered the rotting heads of his father, brother, and uncle, which had been placed on pikes above Micklegate Bar a year earlier after the Battle of Wakefield, to be taken down and replaced with Lancastrian heads. The Tudors were centralizers. Tudor rule meant the rule of the South over the North, wrote one historian. It happened more by pragmatism than intent, they concentrated power where wealth had increasingly become focused over the previous couple of centuries, London and the Southeast. And England, in fact, saw massive changes between Bosworth in 1485 and Elizabeth I's death in 1603. For the North, it was the start of two centuries of greater marginalization. Nonetheless, the North gave the Tudors plenty of trouble. It tended to be conservative, particularly on religious matters. And as in the 21st century, many Northerners were reluctant to follow where the London-based governing class wanted to lead. There were two serious revolts, the Pilgrimage of Grace here in 1536 and the Northern Rebellion of 1569. The pilgrimage started in East Yorkshire and spread across most of the North except for central and southern Lancashire. It involved 
30,000 rebels, making it the largest popular revolt in English history, though it didn't end in fighting. It was sparked by religious, social, and economic grievances, including Henry VIII's dissolution of monasteries. Many people saw a threat in their traditional rituals and beliefs. It was poorly handled by Henry, and it came close to succeeding. Eventually, he outmaneuvered the rebels, first by prevaricating in the face of their demands, and later by finding a pretext to execute their leaders. And their defeat made the English Reformation possible. The, the later revolt, which started in County Durham, was less extensive, but the failure of these two revolts together ultimately strengthened the Tudor state. And to cap it all, the Union of Crowns in 1603 meant the end of the North's border defence role. The 17th century civil wars brought conflict, plague, disruption to trade and plundering of homes and farms. Their geography bore similarities to that of the 2016 EU referendum, although the latter was admittedly less deadly. Uh, the Royalists tended to draw their support most strongly from socially conservative Northern and Western England, similar to that for Brexit, while Parliament drew its support primarily from London, the Southeast and the emerging towns and cities. Uh, the parallels are far from exact and the issues are obviously different, uh, but the pattern does suggest that England's economic and cultural divide has certain recurring features. The first attested casualty was a northerner. Richard Parzival, a linen weaver, was killed in a skirmish with royalists in Manchester in July 1642. The North didn't drive the politics of the war, but many of the battles happened here, notably Marston Moor near York, where the Northern Royalist Army was destroyed. To the North, the Civil War didn't end conflicts. There were Jacobite risings in 1715 and 1745, in which armies invaded via the Northwest. The 1715 invasion ended at Preston. In 1745, Prince Charles Stuart arrived at Manchester, where the locals cannily made a big show of enthusiasm for him, but then failed to sign up to his army in anything like the numbers he had hoped for. Eventually, he turned back at Derby, fearing that three large government armies were approaching, and he got less of a welcome on his way back. The Industrial Revolution from about 1760 was transformative and yet at the same time horrific. Suddenly, a region that had frequently been written off as backward was starring in the key global event, allowing populations to grow and living standards to rise eventually without a Malthusian check from disease or famine. But it also brought wrenching social change Conditions in the cities were gruesome, but they were also bad in the rural areas that people were leaving behind. The North became Britain's engine of growth for 100, maybe 150 years. It drew in migrants, particularly from Ireland, but also from Scotland, Wales, the Midlands and other parts of England. Debate has raged for decades among economic historians about why the Industrial Revolution happened in Britain. Uh, the Victorians like to attribute it to the genius of British inventors, of which the North had many, uh, notably Richard Arkwright here, who invented the water frame for cotton spinning and also played a big part in creating and spreading the factory system. Joseph Aspden, a Leeds brickmaker, invented Portland cement. Leeds-born John Smeaton is credited as the father of civil engineering. More modern theories for why it all happened in Britain include the country having higher wages relative to other countries and that encouraging capital investment in machinery or the way the Enlightenment played out or the adoption of economically liberal policies after the Protestant Revolution of 1688. It's easier in a way to say why the North was important 
It had rivers to provide water power, coal for steam engines. It was connected to Liverpool, giving access to slave-grown cotton. It had soft water and a damp atmosphere, ideal for spinning fine cotton and wool. And it had easy access to sources of iron and chemicals. Importantly too, I think it had a pre-existing cottage-based textile industry. Across the North, industries fed each other. So steam power was in demand to drive textile machinery. Steam power and coal made the railways possible. Textile machinery needed iron and steel, which boosted Sheffield, while high quality steel fed shipyards in Tyneside, Barrow and Liverpool. And there was a huge shift in economic geography. In 1693, Lancashire was the 35th wealthiest of England's 39 counties by tax data. By 1843, it was second, and Durham, Cheshire and Yorkshire had also moved up. The Industrial Revolution transformed Leeds. It had been a small manorial borough in the Middle Ages and became a major centre for the production and trading of wool by the 17th and 18th centuries. Daniel Defoe said its cloth market indeed is a prodigy of its kind and is not to be equaled in the world. It expanded rapidly during the Industrial Revolution. Wool was still the dominant industry, but flax, engineering, iron foundries, printing and other industries were also important. Later, it also developed a sizable clothing industry. Leeds finally gained city status in 1893. The period from about 1790 to 1850 was turbulent. There was explosive population growth, the Napoleonic Wars. There were food shortages caused by climatic disruption after a volcano called Mount Tambora erupted in Indonesia in 1815 sending an ash cloud right across the world and causing what became known as the year without a summer the following year. There were all the stresses of urbanization and industrialization. There was typhus and cholera, and it wasn't just the North. The rural South had the so-called swing riots in 1830 against wage cuts, church tithes, and mechanization. The North faced workers being displaced from their old livelihoods by factories, harsh terms of the trade cycle and a lack of democratic representation. There was Luddite machine breaking, the Peterloo massacre, uh, the working class Chartist reform movement. The Northern Star, the Chartist newspaper was based in Leeds. Slightly differently, there was a successful employer led campaign to abolish the corn laws, which were keeping the price of bread high. All these movements were not always coherent, which is perhaps understandable given the uncertainty. In these times, nobody knew whether all these changes were going to lead to prosperity or starvation. A big feature of the 19th century was immigration notably from Ireland after the famine of the 1840s. Across the North, the Irish were the largest migrant group until the post-1945 wave from the Caribbean, India and Pakistan. There was an anti-Irish backlash. They were routinely portrayed as stupid, drunk, violent and content to live in squalor. Even by Frederick Friedrich Engels, whose own partner was a second generation <laughs> Irish mill worker. Uh, one feature of the book is how the North has been shaped uh, by its repeated waves of migration. After all, where all of us ultimately descended from one migrant group or another. Uh, Leeds owes much to immigrants such as Montague Burton, a Lithuanian Jew, and Polish born Michael Marx, the co-founder of Marx and Spencer, who began as a peddler visiting villages around Leeds. Slavery was an important factor in the Industrial Revolution and cotton in particular benefited massively. Between 1780 and 1807, 
Liverpool ships were responsible for four fifths of slaving voyages to British ports and half of all those originating in Europe. One contemporary described Liverpool as the metropolis of slavery. Even after Britain abolished the slave trade in 1807 and slavery in most of the British Empire in 1833, uh, Liverpool uh, continued to prosper by importing slave grown cotton right up to the US Civil War. Overall, slave trade profits made a significant, though I think probably not decisive, contribution to financing the Industrial Revolution. One recent study calculated that the slave trade generated almost 6% of UK economic output by 1800, and that the value of all slave related industries was put at just over 11%. In the 1860s, Lancashire and surrounding counties became badly affected by the common, co common the, the cotton famine, partly caused by overcapacity and partly by the American Civil War, which caused a blockade of Southern cotton. And there was much hardship. In the first two years, there was a tendency in Britain, including in the mill towns, to support the South. Mill workers formed pro-Confederate clubs and saw the South as a land where white working class men were given opportunities denied to them in Britain. But opinion shifted markedly after President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, redefining the North's war aim as the abolition of slavery. That resonated in Britain, which had, after all, already done it. And you saw the growth of pro-North meetings, famously one at Manchester Free Trade Hall. There was even one in Liverpool that attracted two or 3,000 people. The Victorian era liked to see itself as the age of great cities. In 1800, there were no cities or towns in England and Wales outside London with a population of 100,000 or more. By 1891, there were 23. And the merchants and manufacturers who built these cities aimed to marry commerce with culture and civilization, though often they were also slow to tackle the squalor that accompanied urbanization. Charles Dickens described Leeds on separate occasions as a great town and a beastly place, one of the nastiest places I know. But the Victorians did build great buildings. Leeds Town Hall, completed in 1858, almost bankrupted the city, but it became a model for civic buildings in other parts of Britain and the empire. Uh, it's thought to have been built um, partly uh, on such a grand scale, partly to outdo Bradford, we should just build St. George's Hall. In the Victorian era, despite its penchant for confining women to the home, more women started to achieve public prominence and many were Northerners, including writers such as the Brontes and Elizabeth Gaskell, social reformers such as Josephine Butler here from Northumberland and women's suffrage campaigners such as Lydia Becker from Manchester <laughs> and Emily Davis from Gateshead. Lucy Osborne from Leeds became the founder of modern nursing in Australia. Josephine Butler was arguably the most effective campaigner for women's rights of her time. She succeeded in ending coverture, whereby a woman's legal rights were subsumed by her husband's on, many, on marriage. And she also managed to criminalize child prostitution and human trafficking. Life remained tough, but real incomes rose in the second half of the 19th century and people started to get a bit of leisure time. That led to the growth of popular entertainment in the form of music halls and variety theatres and shopping and excursions. And we saw the creation of parks and libraries and museums. The North led the world in creating professional spectator sports, notably football and rugby league, and to some extent, cricket. 
Scarborough in the 17th century was seen as Britain's first seaside resort. And by the 1880s, Blackpool, previously a sea bathing spot for the wealthy, had become a working class pleasure ground with piers, fortune tellers, pubs, trams, donkey rides, fish and chip shops, and theatres. The Edwardian era is often portrayed a bit misleadingly as a long sunlit afternoon. There was indeed peace and relative prosperity, but it also saw rapid disconcerting changes in science, technology, society and politics. The North was at the forefront of union militancy, the home of the militant suffragette movement created by Emmeline Pankhurst and heavily involved in the creation of the Labour Party. There was a dramatic increase in industrial conflict from 1908, with strikes seen in sectors including cotton, shipbuilding, coal mining. Uh, workers were demanding their share of the increased prosperity they had seen. Most of the North voted first Liberal and later Labour, uh, but Lancashire was always an odd one out with the tradition of working class conservatism. Uh, the reasons for that are often debated. Uh, much of it probably had to do with hostility to Irish Catholic immigration. Uh, that's certainly the case in Liverpool, which to many people's surprise uh, was dominated by the Tory party from 1841 right until the 1970s. But it may also have had to do with Lancashire's older history of isolation and insularity. 1911 can be seen as the North's high point relative to the rest of the UK. In that year, its share of England's population peaked at 36.5%. But the seeds of relative industrial decline had already taken root. The North had become over dependent uh, on industries such as textiles, coal mining, iron, steel, and shipbuilding. Some were not innovating as fast as their global competitors, uh, and the region as a whole was not developing new ones. Since then, the North's share of England's population has slipped to 27.5%, and its share of Britain's economic output has shrunk from 30% just after the First World War to below 20% today. Despite that, the North's economy remains bigger than that of countries, including Argentina, Belgium, Denmark, Ireland, Norway, and Sweden. The interwar period was difficult for many, notably on Tyneside, but also in other parts. There was unemployment, means testing of benefits, hunger marches, a jobless rate two or three times that of the Southeast and Midlands, the modern, North-South economic divide took shape. But even in the North, there was a divide between those in and out of work. For those in employment, there was growth in real wages, shorter hours and paid holidays. White collar and middle class occupations expanded. The consumer economy grew and new suburbs were created. The film industry provided cheap entertainment for the masses. Most films were American, but Northerners, Northerners Gracie Fields from Rochdale and George Formby Jr. from Wigan uh, were homegrown stars. Gracie Fields landed a lucrative Hollywood deal, yet she insisted that the four pictures be filmed in Britain. And when she became ill with cervical cancer in 1939, she received 600,000 cards and letters from well wishers. The Second World War meant that the Norse factories, steelworks, shipyards and coal mines were for a time important again. Liverpool was the most heavily bombed northern city. Hull was also bombed repeatedly. Manchester and Sheffield suffered raids that caused extensive damage. My mother and her brother were evacuated from Manchester to Altrincham in 1939 but typically 
they'd returned to their home in Hume, not far from the docks, by the time the Manchester Blitz happened in December 1940. A bomb destroyed their house with them in it. The raid happened so quickly that though they had a cellar, there was no time to get into it. So the mum, the dad, the three kids and the budgie dived under the kitchen table. It saved their lives. Without that table, I wouldn't be standing here today. The collective effort needed to win the war fueled demand for better housing, employment, and living standards. The post-war decades in Britain were actually a time of unprecedented affluence, uh, social change, trade union battles, immigration, deindustrialization, urban transformation, economic dislocation and renewal. The North shared in post-war prosperity, but its industries were falling inexorably behind and many places were well in decline by the 1970s and 1980s. Since then, there's been some recovery, particularly in cities. Uh, Leeds has become successful as a financial and professional services centre. But particular problems remain in places such as coal fields, some former mill towns and seaside towns. Uh, successive governments have tried to address these but they've not always learned from the experience of their predecessors. But it wasn't all bad news. The arrival of the Arts Council in 1946, with a brief to stimulate the arts in the regions, helped to create a resurgence of regional theater and drama from the early 1960s. Spawning writers, including Sheila Delaney, Keith Waterhouse and David Storey. Films of Northern life became briefly fashionable in the late 50s and early 60s. And then there was the pop music. Early in the 1960s, we had the Mersey Beat, notably the Beatles, but also Jerry and the Pacemakers, the Searchers and Scylla Black. The Manchester music scene took off from the late 1970s with Joy Division, New Order, The Smiths and Stone Roses. And later on, Sheffield, uh, produced bands such as Human League, Pulp and Arctic Monkeys. And so, as we stand in 2022, the North faces its future amid a level of uncertainty that we have grown accustomed to. Northern towns were central to the UK's narrow vote for Brexit in the 2016 EU referendum. Leeds was an exception, narrowly voting remain by 50.3%. The way the North as a whole voted wasn't a huge surprise because even in the 1975 EU referendum, uh, the North had a slightly higher no vote than the rest of England. And at the 2019 general election, the crumbling of the so-called parts of the so-called red wall of former Labour seats in the North, the Midlands and Northeast Wales he counted for almost half of conservative gains. Do these results signal a permanent realignment? We'll have to see. At the moment, I think based on the turmoil of the past few weeks, you say that was far from certain. On the economy, the divide is sadly still with us. Boris Johnson, so-called levelling up, seems to be surviving in some form under Rishi Sunak. But what will it mean in practice? Will it be any more successful than we, efforts we have seen by government since Stanley Baldwin in the 1920s? Again, we have yet to see. Uh, what I think history broadly suggests uh, is that the North can't just rely on national politicians and a revival is unlikely to happen without the talents, energy and enterprise of Northerners. So that's your Northern history in a nutshell. It may be all you want to know. Uh, there is obviously more detail in the book, which is available from bookshops, all the online booksellers. There, uh, uh, you can ask for it at libraries. It's, uh, there's an e-book and an audio book. Uh, for those in the room, if anybody wants one this evening, I've brought a few with me 
which I could do for 18 pounds, uh, but it has to be cash or check because I haven't entered the 21st century yet. <laughs> so I have a few other coins with me. Anyway, thank you for listening to me so patiently. Uh, it's been an absolute privilege to talk to you. And thank you so much for inviting me. And um, you've been a lovely audience. Thank you very much. It's remarkable to cover so many years with so many interesting remarks in such a short time. We do have a little time for questions. Has anyone in the room got a question they'd like to ask by? Yes. Um, can I, if you, people can ask questions, I'm going to turn around the microphone and the camera so you will be seen by people at home <laughs> and they'll be able to hear you, I hope. Okay. Um, I want to go right back to the beginning of what you said mm -hmm. and the definition, your definition. I like the definition of the North, both the way you slice it. Can you just talk a little louder so people on oh, Zoom can hear you? Shall I come up here? Yeah. <laughs> I like, the I like the definition of the North and the way you sidestepped all those debates about the historic seven counties and things. But I'm particularly interested in the idea of the North, if you like, the mentalities. And I wondered why, when you thought people started self-identifying as Northerners. I mean, there's, there's evidence in literature, certainly in Chaucer's time or slightly earlier than that, um, and Bede himself uh, um, said that the Humber had divided the people of the, the Northumbriensis from the others. So there was a, a consciousness of some kind of divide right from Anglo-Saxon times. I imagine there was always some kind of um, uh, some kind of consciousness about it, um, and it, it goes two ways in the. Um, the Wakefield Second Shepherd's play, which is a medieval, um, medieval mystery play. The, um, there's a, um, um, a character called Mac the Sheep Stealer, and the other shepherds mock his southern accent. Uh, admittedly, most of the disparaging remarks do go the other way that we can find from history, but that's one example of Northerners giving back um, as good as they got. And I think, I think, I think the con, and it's changed massively. Um, uh, it shifted during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, North did tend to look down on the South during, certainly when it became prosperous during the industry. You know, we made the money. You know, we made the money here, and, and um, um, but but it, it's, it's changed again since then. So it evolves constantly. But I, I think there always has been some kind of divide. Any more questions? Yes. So that can just be, um, turn the microphone around in the direction. I've, I've read some of the book and you've kind of completed the story for me there. I, I can't just spoil the plot. That's okay. No, I, I think I could guess what was coming. But the, the thing that strikes me is there's a sense of mutual dependency between North and South. And there's a sort of story of the North being the provider of, you know, armies and, and, and labor and materials and all of that. And then I'm just wondering if there's a sense that the South still see that dependency or whether there's a sense that that mutuality is starting to move away now. It's a good question. I don't know. Uh, um, especially with globalization, it's a, it's a question of whether they're quite as mutually dependent as they were. One thing I had to, 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 to look at in detail for another for a, for a, um, a festival in the summer was um, the, the geological and climate change divide, which is a fascinating story. The, um, the um, historians in the past have often talked about North as being mainly a high, dividing England into a highland zone and a lowland zone. And it, it's an oversimplification, but broadly it's true that sort of north and west of a certain line, you tend to get higher, higher ground, thinner soils. You've got isolated, um, isolated farmsteads, the raising of sheep and sometimes cattle, uh, small hamlets. South and east of that, you tended to get more richer farmland, uh, uh, creation of bigger villages. You saw the growth of pottery earlier there. Um, um, but then it, all that got suddenly reversed in the Industrial Revolution, and all those factors that had been um, that had been seemed to be holding the North back were suddenly suddenly advantages. 
um, though to an extent that's gone into reverse again, and it's a, it's contestable now. You know, North trying to trying to capture the uh, some of the green industries, which might revive a little bit of it. But it's a uh, it's a, no, it's a, you know you're right. The mutual dependency is, is very interesting. Can I read you a fun list? It's not from my book. This this is from um, a book by Dave Russell called Looking North from the early two thousands, and he listed um, <laughs> the one thing I, I don't do in the book is try to define northern identity. Not because I don't think it's possible, but because I think it's complex and multi-layered. Um, now he gave a list of what he saw as northern characteristics as perceived by northerners against the same characteristics as perceived by other people, mainly southerners. And the northern list read uh, independent, blunt, straight talking, hard working and physically tough, competitive, practical and productive, careful with money. Friendly and hospitable, proud of roots and identity, meritocratic and egalitarian, knowledgeable, holding strong views, humorous and witty. And the same characteristics perceived from the South read truculent, carrying the trip on the shoulder, rude, lacking social graces, hardworking, over competitive, ungentlemanly. Philistine, unpolished, albeit <laughs> highly musical, <laughs> mean, homely, parochial, working class, prejudiced and biased, humorous if crude. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Do we have any more questions? Was, were those lists put together by a northern or a southerner? Either, um, <laughs> I think it's a northerner. He used to teach at Lancaster University. Yeah. He still gives talks in very places. Bob was biased then, really. Sorry? Born in the South, haven't we? Yes, quite right. Um, the great book, by the way. Do we have any more questions? There are no questions on Zoom, but a lot of people thanking you for your uh, talk. So if there are no further questions, it remains only for me to thank Brian again for the most excellent and interesting and illuminating talk with very carefully chosen illustrations and very carefully chosen examples to illustrate the history of the North over very many years. So we're very grateful to you for that.